Hey guys, welcome back to Tabletop Glory. My name is Graham Johnson, and today we're gonna to be talking about this Commander Farsight. Now he is a limited color palette that was request directed by my friend who commissioned me to work on this beautiful model. Now this is a fine cast from GW, and there were some issues as a result of fine cast, but this one actually went together fairly well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the assembly process, although I don't have much footage from that, and we're gonna give a basic tutorial on how this guy all went together. So here you can see I gave myself a little bit of a test here. Now I know spoons aren't great for a test, but I just wanted to get a good idea on how those colors were going to fade together. We're starting with our highlights and we're moving into our shadows. So right now I'm spraying Talisar Blue all over everything, and then for my shadows I'm going to go ahead and use Ultramarine Blue. Now these are contrast paints. You don't need to use contrast paints, but I just wanted to make things a little bit easier and to use some of my Xenophil highlighting from before to kind of help things along a little bit and to push those shadows to where I really wanted them. Now thanks to the shape of Commander Farsight, he almost looks a bit two-tone at one point. And although I really liked the way that that two-tone kind of looked, it didn't look realistic and I was also wanting to push the shadows a bit more. So ultimately that two-tone look ends up going away and I blend the blues together in a bit more of a realistic fashion. And ultimately when I came to the final result, I think I was a lot happier with what I ended up with than what I would have had had I kept the two-tone appearance. Now if you're following along at home, I recommend doing something called overbrushing when it comes to putting your shadows in. We're going to go ahead and show you an example of that now. So traditionally when we would dry brush, we would load up our brush, get a lot of paint on it, and then we kind of work some of that back off. And the goal of this is so that when we drag it across texture, in the case of this dress, we leave very little behind. Now with overbrushing, we do something similar, but we don't take as much paint out of the brush. And then when we work it back and forth across those same details, you'll see that we actually leave very little in those cracks and crevices, and we pretty much cover up most of this. Now, if you wanted to do kind of like a three-tone highlight, you could paint the base tone, do an overbrush, and then do a dry brush, and you would end up with three distinct layers. And this can work really well for fabric. Now personally, I'm not a big fan of all over edge highlights. Um, it's just a very tedious thing, and especially on a miniature like this where you kind of need to be a bit more precise with your edge highlights. Now there are some ways that the way that I like to do edge highlighting can be applied to this, but mostly we just have to do an all over edge highlight. And that's mostly because of the blends of the blue, but also the fact that this is a mechanized unit and it's all armor with sharp angles and we really need to apply that edge highlight. So I'm using three different colors for this. I'm using Rust Gray, Fenrisian Gray, and Telsius Blue. Now I'm using Telsius Blue kind of as like a, um, a mother or base color in this case where I'm adding small amounts of Telsius Blue into my Fenrisian Gray and my Rust Gray. And then I'm also making blends of those two colors. And what I'm doing this for is so that my Fenrisian Gray can be used as my most extreme highlight where I can add a small amount to white just to get that extra little pop and my rust gray can be my maximum highlight for all of my shadows and I'm kind of just putting this rust gray all over everywhere and then anywhere where it doesn't quite pop I'm going back in and adding that Fenrisian gray mixture and then where that doesn't quite pop I'm adding a small amount of white into that Fenrisian gray and adding that now there's very few places where I'm adding pure white into my Fenrisian gray and it's mostly just on the sharpest edges and the highest most highlights. Now a while back one of you suggested that I not go so crazy with the high speed footage as well as to not do so many sharp cuts. You guys said that you want to follow along sometimes and following along can be hard when I do those nice sharp edge. Uh, cuts where I just immediately snap from one thing to another. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna speed up the footage a little bit, but I'm not gonna go crazy with it. And I'm gonna give you guys a bit of a time lapse of me putting all the edge highlights on, and just so you guys can get a good understanding of just what I mean when I say we really gotta put those edge highlights all over the miniature.
So now that we have all of those edge highlights done, thank goodness, I really don't enjoy that part of the model making process. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take some of this. Now this is gun metal from Vallejo. This is their alcohol based pigments and we're gonna use this for all of the mechanical parts. Now this was specifically requested by the person who commissioned me to do this miniature. You could choose whatever metallic colors you really want. I've seen people paint all the metallic parts gold and then do all the little baubles in silver. Uh, I personally happen to really like the gunmetal appearance with maybe some edge highlights here and there in silver and all of the little baubles in gold. So that is what we're going to do. Don't forget to paint the insides of the vents. Now some people like to paint the whole vent black, but because we'll be doing some OSL later, I wanna have some metallic underneath. So we're gonna go ahead and use the gunmetal color on these vents, and that's going to take care of all of that for later. And one of the last things we're gonna go ahead and do besides the weapon is make sure that in between the joints on the hand, those knuckles, they have some mechanical parts exposed in there. We're gonna go ahead and make those metal as well. Now you may wanna go with a brighter silver as those mechanical parts do tend to move around a lot. And that may be a place where on the knuckles you may want to edge highlight in silver rather than a brighter blue, just because those mechanical parts, like I said, do move around a lot and they are gonna bump up against each other paint is going to chip more often and that may also be a place where you want to focus weathering if you want to do a heavily weathered version of this. Now like I said before we're going to be painting all of the baubles and all of the symbols, the fire cast symbols. We're going to go ahead and paint those in gold. Now you could do kind of a faded effect between different kinds of reds to give it more of a fiery appearance but for the sake of simplicity and the sake of time we're going to go ahead and do these in gold. I think they look a lot better in gold as well and if you want to give them a bit of an aged appearance you can wash them in Reichland flesh shade which is a bit of a warm red tone. Now we want to make sure to get all of the little baubles. I really like to do all of them in gold, so all the little ones on the legs, the ones on the jump pack, all of the ones around the head. There's a lot of little baubles all over the place, so just keep an eye out and go ahead and hit those with gold or whatever your metallic color of choice happens to be. Now I wanted some of these baubles to have a little bit more of a pop to them. I didn't want them to be like dull in their luster, so I went ahead and hit them with the gold yet again. Now if I had put more than one coat of Reichland Flesh Shade on the gold, this would have been a lot more noticeable, but I wanted this to be this subtle thing. I wanted the highlight to not be super in your face. Now if you like highlights that are a bit more in your face, where you have really stark contrast between your shadows and your highlights, you may want to go ahead and put three or four coats of Reichland Flesh Shade on before you go ahead and add in all of your highlights with your gold in this step and that'll give you more of a stark transition. So I'm going to be sharing a bit of a life hack when it comes to putting on oil washes or enamel washes. We want to go ahead and cover our model in some kind of a clear coat, preferably gloss, as that's going to help to break down the surface tension and make sure that the wash goes where we want it and sticks to the crevices instead of just flowing all over the surface and sticking to the surface. It will also make things a little easier to clean up if you make a mistake and easier to wipe up both with a finger or later with some enamel thinners or some kind of oil thinners if you happen to be using enamel or oil paints. I prefer testers as a brand. I've never once ever had a problem with testers enamel, whether it be gloss, matte, varnish of any kind. Uh, but I have had issues with many other brands, but I've never had a problem with testers, at least not yet. So at this point I switched my focus to everything that I didn't want to have some kind of satin or glossy finish, mostly anything that's going to end up being matte. I wanted to go ahead and handle that right here right now. So that's why we're going to go ahead and put all of the black on. Now I'm focusing my black mostly on these vents on the jump pack. Uh, you may decide you want to put some black in a few other places. Just recognize that the difference in texture that you're going to receive between the gloss and the matte if you don't plan to universify it at the end by putting matte all over everything is going to make the black look more like rubber and more like plastic. So keep that in mind when picking out where to place your textures. This is oftentimes something that can be used to our advantage when we paint other models by adding both satin, gloss, 
matte and other types of finishes to different materials, we can oftentimes really sell the illusion that it's actually made of something else. One of these great examples is if you've got some kind of flamethrower for a space marine, you may want to paint all the tubes black, put a matte finish on them and a satin finish on your space marine, and it'll really sell the illusion that that space marine's rubber hosing is actually rubber and not just a painted piece of plastic. Speaking about how we can use our paints and our finishes to our advantage, we're gonna go ahead and start painting the ribbons. Now I'm gonna be using a base tone of corn red, working up into Mephiston red, working into Jerica orange, and then mixing a little bit of Everland Sunset into my Jerica orange for my extreme highlights. Now, I'll put all that on screen because I know I spoke quite quickly. When it comes to our miniatures, not just the way that we paint them, but the textures that we add through the painting process can really help to tell or sell the story we're trying to tell with our miniatures, whether they be a part of a diorama or part of an army. So in this case, with these ribbons, I'm building up my textures from my deepest red all the way up to my brightest orange. And what we're going to be doing is as we add more highlights and as we choose where our extreme highlights going we're not drawing straight perfect thin lines like we were with all the edge highlighting with the rest of the miniature we're actually kind of feathering things out we're stippling we're adding all kinds of texture that isn't sculpted there because what that's going to do is it's going to help to sell the illusion that this is a piece of fabric and not necessarily the hard thin piece of plastic that it's sculpted as you can see throughout the course of me painting this ribbon, I've used a mixture of the side of the brush, the tip of the brush, and I've done a lot of non-traditional ways of adding this highlight to this ribbon. And all of this is going to combine together to talk about that texture that I keep bringing up. Texture is such an important part of our miniature painting, and it's something that I really struggle with a lot of times, and I feel like that's where a lot of the realism comes into play. Not just in the difference in contrast between our light levels, but as well as the texture and the materials that we're trying to paint or the material that we're trying to make the viewer feel when they look at our miniatures. We're quickly approaching the end of this project and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do those who's as and I eventually settled on black as I knew that no matter what kind of weathering I added to them it would pop because we were going for a post-apocalyptic kind of um, almost urban setting for where wherever this war that he is currently in is taking place and so I knew that the grays and other earthy tones that I wanted to add as part of the weathering were going to really really look nice against that black so we went ahead and marked out their feet in black some of the other colors that I had heavily considered was also that lighter gray that I used throughout the paint scheme as well as I also considered making the feet red and then adding some other red details in a few other places uh, but I decided that would be a little bit too much that would be taking your eyes away from the focus which is the face of the miniature the shield the sword I, I didn't want to distract from what the miniature was and the pose that it has by making you look at its feet by putting super vibrant colors down there now I'm not using any gray in particular for the edge highlights. I did just mix up by mixing black and white together to kind of get this nice deep gray color. And we're just slapping on our edge highlights. I'm not being super careful on this stage because again, these are the feet. They're gonna get beat up. There's gonna be a lot of weathering. I plan to add a lot of dirt and dust around the feet anyway. So it's not super crucial that everything be perfectly crisp. One of the last details I was asked to add was any kind of lighting or lenses be done in a green tone. So we're gonna be starting out with warp stone and then mixing some moot green in to get our brighter tones. We'll add just a tiny bit of white into what's left of that to get our extreme hot spots for inside the engine bays. Now I'm going to go ahead and let this footage play out because once again you guys had talked about how you would like to see more of my process and not just all the hard cuts. So I'm going to go ahead and let this play out so you can kind of see in the places where I kind of very easily, you know, very gently lay down some color like on the gun here as whereas well in the engine bays I kind of have a better understanding of where the paint's going to end up. And so you'll see I'll actually go quite a bit harder and put down more paint more quickly. And here you can just see me applying by hand some hot spots. This is just a little bit of white mixed in with that moot green mixture to make it nice and bright green. And we're going to water it down so that it flows into the cracks and crevices. And this will also get applied to those vents as well on the jump pack. 
We're just gonna do a little bit of weathering on this guy. Now I'm not wanting to go super crazy. We're not gonna be adding lots of little silver flecks all over the place from paint chipping off. But what we are going to do is we're gonna be using some Mornfang Brown on this sponge. Now you see me breaking off a little piece of it. This is so I can be a bit more aggressive with it. We basically wanna replicate dry brushing where we kinda of wanna load the sponge up, dab it off on a paper towel until the pattern we're getting kind of mimics what looks like a realistic rust pattern. We're not trying to leave big, huge splotches of paint behind. You can see as I kind of work it into the paper towel that there's less and less and it's more erratic and they're nice little pieces of little brown flecks. And then we're just going to apply this along the edges of the pieces of armor that are going to be moving around the most or interacting with the ground or interacting with each other. So spots around the cod piece, around the legs, maybe a little bit in and around the shoulders or inside of the armpits it's up to you really where you want to put this this is all kind of flavoring and is going to be different on every single miniature that you do so there is no right or wrong answer just kind of have a, a little bit of an experiment around and enjoy the process one of the last pieces of weathering I'm going to do on this miniature before I work on the base, and I will be doing the base off screen, is I'm going through with a little bit of silver. Now, depending upon in the lore, if the armor is made of some special kind of metal that has a gold color to it, then you may want to use gold. But in the case of my miniature, I'm just using silver. And we're just adding little tiny pock marks, little places where the paint has chipped off or, or we're giving the illusion that the paint has chipped off to reveal the bare metal underneath. The best places to add these sometimes is along the edges where we've had some of our brown paint for our little rust spots to kind of go ahead and place a little bit of silver in and around there. You can also do little scratches and nicks but I wanted this miniature to look as though perhaps he hasn't been out in the battle for very long so he's not got tons of marks on him yet he's just got a little bit of wear and tear from walking around and doing his normal thing so that's why we're kind of going really light with how much I'm putting on and we're focusing around the legs where the high impact points would be from maneuvering around and things like that so depending on the type of story you're wanting to tell you're going to put your silver in a different place I wish there was a formula I could give you where I could tell you put it here here and here when in reality it's going to be different on every single miniature and it's something you're gonna to have to just kind of eyeball and figure out for yourself so Unfortunately, I don't have a solid solution for everyone other than to just experiment around and have some fun. Well, that's going to do it for me this week, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much for all the love and support both here and on social media. It really means the world to me, as well as thanks for all the wonderful feedback and great ideas for future videos. As a reminder, if you've got a great idea for a video, go ahead and suggest it below, and maybe you will be the inspiration for next week's video. In any case, if you guys are interested in seeing how I do bases, I've got a few videos about that on the channel already, so you can go check those out. If you're interested in seeing more stuff like an urban environment type thing, let me know and I'll do a video dedicated to that. And last but certainly not least, thank you so much to my Patreon subscribers. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. Whether you've just subscribed for one month or you're an ongoing subscriber, I really do appreciate it. So thank you all so much. 